Hello and welcome to lecture 4 of electromagnetic induction in Phys 1204. Earlier in the course we met resistors and batteries and capacitors and up to this point those are all the circuit elements that we have to play with. Now we're going to add inductors because we couldn't add them until we understood Faraday's law. Notice that the flux through coils that we've looked at has always been a flux created by something else. So in the original example we saw we had the coil, we had this permanent magnet, and the flux through the coil was because of the B field produced by that permanent magnet. Then last lecture we looked at this copper ring and there was a flux through it due to the B field produced by this solenoid that it was inside. But notice that when a coil or solenoid has a current running in it, it produces a B field inside itself, and so that means it makes a flux. So it produces its own flux. If it's a solenoid, let's say this is a solenoid, then the B field is uniform inside it, and so the magnetic flux is just the, that uniform B field times the area of the solenoid. And that's only strictly true if it's an infinitely long solenoid, but it's pretty close for any real solenoid. Well, that B field depends on the amount of current through the coil. And so this raises a question, because we know Faraday's law tells us that if the flux through the coil changes, it'll generate an EMF on the coil. Well, so since the coil produces its own flux, if we change the current through the coil, does this result in an EMF in the coil? That might seem sort of strange to you, because, you know, things can't exert forces on themselves, and these EMFs are to do with forces being exerted on the charges. Surely this current can't exert a force on itself, right? But experimentally, you find that, in fact, if you change the current through the coil, you do generate an EMF. And it's not really that hard to see that there's no contradiction here, because this current isn't a single thing. It's a huge assembly of, you know, perhaps many moles of electrons. And while no electron can exert a force on itself, all the other electrons in here can exert forces on it. And so there's no contradiction. The fact that you can make a coil generate an EMF across itself suggests that it ought to be pretty useful in a circuit. And so here I've drawn a circuit with resistors and capacitors and batteries that we're familiar with, and here's a coil. And when it's in a circuit, we call it an inductor. And just as a resistor is characterized by a resistance, which tells you something about how quickly it converts thermal uh, electrical potential energy into thermal energy, and a capacitor is defined by a capacitance, which tells you how much charge per unit voltage applied across it it stores. An inductor is going to be characterized by some quantity that we'll call the inductance, but we need to figure out what inductance means. So I'm going to work from analogy with capacitance, right? A capacitance is a stored charge per unit voltage. You can also think of the other thing a capacitor does, other than storing charge, is that it stores electrical potential energy. But I want to define still another way of thinking of a capacitor. So you know that a capacitor has an E field inside it, given by this. And if I just slightly rearrange that, then we see this. Well, if you think of a capacitor as storing charge, and this is just a constant, you can equivalently think of it as storing this quantity Ea. Well, what the heck is this Ea? We've actually seen it. It's an electrical flux. So you could, if you wish, think of a capacitor as a thing that stores electrical flux. I don't know why you would, except that it gives us an idea for how to think of what an inductor does. You can think of an inductor as a thing which stores magnetic flux, and that makes a certain amount of sense because we've seen that magnetic flux seems to be important for coils. So we've decided that in analogy to a capacitor which stores charge, or you can think of it as storing electrical flux, an inductor stores magnetic flux. So now by analogy we should be able to define the inductance. 
So think about capacitance. It says that if you want to increase the amount of charge on the capacitor, you have to increase the voltage across it. So similarly over here for inductance, given that it's storing magnetic flux, it should be proportional to the magnetic flux on the inductor. But now what is it that you increase if you want to increase the magnetic flux? Well that's easy. You need to increase the B field inside the inductor and you do that by increasing the current. And so this is in fact the definition of inductance. It's magnetic flux per unit current through the coil. We should take a quick moment to talk about units. So that flux is in Weber's. So we have Weber's per amp as a unit of inductance. And this is called a Henry. And typical coils have inductances in the milli or micro Henry range. And it's worth noting that a Weber we've seen is a volt second. So this is a volt second per amp. And a volt is a joule per coulomb. And a coulomb per second is an amp. So this is joules per amp squared, which suggests that the energy stored in an inductor must be something like the inductance times the current squared. We'll see that's almost correct. It's just missing a factor. A solenoid is probably the most common type of inductor. So let's figure out how to calculate the inductance of a solenoid. So we know that in a solenoid, the thing that's special is that it has a uniform B field, and it's just mu naught times the coil density times I, right? That coil density is number of coils per unit length. So let me write it that, mu naught coils, number of coils over the length of the solenoid. And so the flux, since that B field is uniform, it would just be B times A, except remember that field goes through n loops of the solenoid. And so you have to multiply that by the n loops that that B field goes through. And so now we're pretty much done because we can calculate our L. It's B, so mu naught n i over L times the cross-sectional area times n all divided by I. And so the currents cancel and we're left with just mu naught the cross-sectional area n squared over L. So here is an inductor and let's say the current is running through it like so. And let's say that current is increasing so that means the B field in here is increasing. And so there's a delta B like so, which Farad, uh, Lenz's law tells us means there's an induced B field back like so. And that induced B field is consistent with a current going the other way. Well, think of what that does. That current going the other way is transporting positive charge this way. And so we're getting a buildup of positive charge on that end and negative charge on that end. This is our induced EMF. And if you're traveling with the current, that's a voltage drop that you see. And let's just see how big it is. Faraday's law tells us, and I'll point out, that the inductance is the flux per unit current. And so we can write the flux as just L times I. And so this EMF is, and I'm going to drop the absolute values for the moment, D by DT of LI. And L is just a constant, so it can come out front, and we have this. And so now we have the EMF in terms of the current and how the current is behaving. It would be nice to have a sign convention, so let's compare it with a resistor. In a resistor, we know that if we define this direction as the direction of the current, then we have a voltage drop across it. And you could say 
that are delta V across the resistor with that sign convention is negative IR, right? When you write it into a Kirchhoff's law, a Kirchhoff's loop law, you put that negative if you're going through with the current. So if you're going through an inductor with the current, and if the current is increasing, right? So that means it's getting more positive. We've seen again up here that you will see a voltage drop. And so we should have to have that same negative. So it should be negative L di by dt. Note, if I is decreasing, if the current is getting smaller, now di by, by dt is negative and you'll get a voltage rise across the inductor. In other words, it's trying to push the current through to stop it from reducing. Power in an inductor, as always, can be found by I epsilon. And so I've just put in the epsilon that we now know for an inductor. And now I can get the potential energy, because that power is a change in potential energy, except this is a change in electrical potential energy. So this is the power being lost by the current. And so that has to be the negative of the power being stored in the inductor. And so we get a plus here. And so I will write it this way, Li di by dt. Okay, well now I can integrate to get ue. So I'm going to integrate with respect to t. Mathematicians, hide your eyes as I cancel differentials. And so this is ue equals, and I have the L can come out front, integral i di, and so that is just a half L i squared. And you might ask, how is that energy being stored? It's being stored in the magnetic field inside the inductor. Let's finish this lecture by looking at something called an LR circuit. That's just a circuit with an inductor and a resistor. So you initially hook it up to a battery to get a current flowing. You eventually have a nice constant current. Then you flick the switch to isolate it from the battery. And this current is now going to decay because of dissipation in the resistor. But let's look at how. So we'll do a loop law going around with the current. And so that is going to be negative ri, there's our voltage across the resistor, and our sign convention tells us this is negative di by dt. There's Kirchhoff's loop law. And note, this is telling us for this to be zero, this term has to be positive. So the current is decreasing. That derivative is negative. We're going to solve for di by dt. And now I'm going to put all my i's on one side of the equation and everything else on the other side. And this is something I can now integrate. I'm going to integrate from t equals 0 to some later t. At t equals 0, there's some initial current that I'll call i naught. And those are simple integrals. We just get a negative r over l t, and here that's a lawn, right? And I don't have to worry about any absolute values because that current is positive. Plugging in the boundaries i naught and i, you get lawn And as usual, when you have a lawn sitting around like this, it's convenient to exponentiate both sides. And you end up with this. Which you can write in terms of a time constant, where that time constant is now L over R. So this behavior is very much like the RC circuits that we saw earlier in the course. It's an exponential decay. The difference is that the time constant is different.